well. Thank you all for coming out tonight. My name is Ann Eden. I'm the Senior Fisheries Program Manager at uh, Manomet, which is a nonprofit that is uh, focused on sustainability issues. Um, my work is in fisheries, sustaining, restoring, and sustaining and growing our fisheries. Uh, but we do a lot of work um, with things as varied as uh, grocery stores, working with 500 grocery stores across the country to get them to reduce their carbon footprint, it's in their financial interest, um, to uh, restoring habitat for shorebirds, that's a big program we have where we have staff uh, up and down the western hemisphere um, protecting the migrating um, habitats and um, on the, anyway. You can look up me on that if you're, if you're interested. So my talk tonight is about the future of fishing in a rapidly warming uh, Gulf of Maine. And I just want to give you a quick overview. Um, before I talk about the future, I want to talk a little bit about the past because it's instructive of um, how productive the Gulf of Maine is, was, and what we might set as a goal. Um, going forward. Talk a little bit about where things stand at the present and then just a review of what climate, uh, climate scientists are telling us about the um, impacts of climate change on the Gulf of Maine. You'll hear a lot more from George Jacobson if you come back. And then um, focusing on what we at Manomet are doing to help fishermen, fishing communities adapt to the climate change that is happening in real time and as you all know we will be um, dealing with for 50 years, approximately, even if we stopped our emissions um, today. So, this is what fisheries in the Gulf of Maine used to look like 50 to 70 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of big fish, cod, haddock, halibut, tuna, um, and a lot of shrimp, scallops, soft-shell clams, a lot of lobsters, although nothing like what we have now. And, uh, but most importantly, we had a lot of diversity. Fishermen often fish for over a, do a dozen different species at different times of the year. They used to call it the annual round of fishing. Fishing was near shore, so it was when the species was near shore, lobsters go offshore in the winter there, you know, et cetera. Um, today, most fishermen fish for one species, uh, the lobster. So now I want to go uh, further back and talk about the cod fishery in the 19th century and um, tell you a story about Frenchman's Bay and the fishery there in 1861. It demonstrates the incredible productivity of the cod stock at that time. Um, and these are the massive stocks of this fish that, that got uh, attracted Europeans to come here 400 years ago. And of course, it's a cautionary tale because essentially the cod fishery has collapsed in the Gulf of Maine today. But uh, the story in 1861 in Frenchman's Bay was very different. And we know this from researchers who analyzed log books from uh, the uh, Frenchman's Bay for, they, they had a complete set for the entire year. And they did the incredible work of converting what a quintail of dried cod means in today's um, units. And uh, the, what the fishery looked like was sailing vessels, of course, like these. There were 220 of them that fished out of Frenchman's Bay. The fishermen lined up along the rail, hand lines, hook and line, over the side. They fished no more than 20 miles from the coast, but up and down the uh, coastal shelf of eastern Maine. In 1861, they caught 21 million pounds of cod. <coughs> now, the, these uh, researchers extrapolated this to the other fishing fleets around the Gulf of Maine and estimated that 132 million pounds of cod were caught in the Gulf of Maine in 1861. And to put that in perspective, our landings in 2017 from the entire Gulf of Maine were less than 2 million. So just the, the productivity is amazing. Our uh, fishery system has transformed from being very diverse to now depending on very few species. And um, let's just take a look at what it looks like now. 
So this is the present, and this is, well, this is 2018, commercial main landings, and landings are the, um, this is the value. So this is what fishermen get, get at the dock for the fish they are landing. And 76% um, of the value is derived from lobster. So it just shows you how dependent we are on it. Um, it puts us in a very precarious position considering that this system is now being subject to climate change. Uh, the the um, total value, landed value for lobster is about, is almost $500 million, so half a billion dollars, so that's a, that's a, that's a big number. But it's not just Maine, but all of New England, where the total value of fisheries is 1.3 billion. Now, somebody else has calculated the multiplier effect. Um, the total economic impact is 2.6 billion and is, um, accounts for more than 100,000 jobs. So this is a significant economic activity in our region. But much of it is, consists of two species, lobster as in Maine. And you can see that Maine accounts for the vast majority of the, of the lobster landings. Massachusetts adding you know, 163 million, and then uh, scallops, which is a, a very valuable fishery as well. Um, and we hear a lot about agriculture in New England, well, especially around here, we hear a lot about land-based salmon. Uh, but the revenue from aquaculture in um, 2016, which is the most recent data we have, was only about 158 million. So, in, and much of that is the farm salmon that we already have. So it is, it is not, uh, doesn't rival our wild fisheries, although everything you would hear would suggest that our wild fisheries are, um, you know, on, on the verge of extinction. If we didn't have aquaculture, we wouldn't have any seafood. It's not true yet. Okay, so climate impacts, you've probably all, all heard that the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the rest of the world's oceans. This is work by Amy Pershing at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. This is the the slope of the line um, from 1980 to 2015. So that's a warming. And then if you just look at the last, well, 2005 to 2015, you can see that it's warming faster. And why is that? Um, the Gulf of Maine is a semi-enclosed sea. So this is George's Bank. You can't see it, it's underwater, but not very far. And it basically cuts the, the Gulf of Maine off from the rest of the ocean. And there are two channels, the Northeast Channel, which is the deepest one, and then the Great South Channel over here. Um, but the reason the Gulf of Maine is warming faster is it's not just warming from the effect of warmer air, like we all feel, but it's a, a function of the interaction of these two currents, the Gulf Stream, and the Labrador current. Now, before climate impacts, the interaction of these currents, uh, more of the, what the water that was coming into the Gulf of Maine was coming from the Labrador current. But because of the warming impacts in the Arctic, now there is, uh, the Labrador current is weaker, the Gulf, it's not pushing the Gulf Stream offshore, and there's more impact from the Gulf Stream so that the Gulf of Maine is actually warming, not just at the surface, uh, but at depth. And um, this is one of these things that I had to put in here that's changed. This is a report that you may have seen reported on last week in the news that the UN just put out a report, uh, the world's oceans are in danger, um, the heat is on. And it, so what we're experiencing here in the Gulf of Maine, it's happening a little bit faster, but we're, we're not as worried about sea level rise as many places of hurricanes, um, impacts on fisheries where people depend on those fish for sustenance, etc. cetera. Um, it's, a, it's a really serious problem. So how are warming waters affecting our fisheries? Species are shifting as they follow temperatures that they're used to. And I don't know about you, but I miss this fishery, the, the uh, northern shrimp, and it's been closed since 2012. A lot of people assume that was because of overharvesting. In fact, it's a climate effect. Um, you're 
do you recognize this fish? This black is bass. Black sea bass. Um, it's a species uh, common in the mid-Atlantic. It is a temperate reef fish. It's a big fishery down there. It has appeared in the Gulf of Maine and its um, population is, is growing rapidly. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. Um, we also have invasive species. I don't need to tell you about the green crab, but here's a story from the Bangor Daily News. Also last week, the Asian shore crab has now made its way to Scudic Point, and it appears to be have similar habits as the green crab, and in fact, will maybe eat the green crab. So who knows? But it's it just um, these are things that we really didn't see coming. And, and this has come uh, from uh, ballast water, or? I assume so. Yeah. So the, the, uh, what's interesting about the green crab is it's been here for 100 years or more. But it was the increase in temperature that really gave it the conditions that it wanted and allowed it to outcompete. The, um, and, the, and it originated in Europe, is in that Europe. correct? But the climate impacts are much more than species sort of marching north in, um, in, in lockstep or invasive species taking advantage of warming waters. There are changes in the structure of the Gulf of Maine ecosystem from the base of the food chain on up that um, are, from my perspective, more alarming than the green crab. Uh, the productivity of single-celled algae, the basis of the food chain, phytoplankton, is down in the Gulf of Maine. Now, this is the basis of our food chain. Um, scientists don't have a good handle on why that is. One theory is that because we have more rain and less snow now, we have more runoff, and we are getting more tannins into the water, and there's just literally less sunlight getting into the water. But that, that's a hypothesis that hasn't been tested. But the, the composition of the zooplankton, so the, um, I did it at the short bottom. Um, this little guy, it's big in the picture, this is a copepod called Calanus finmarficus. And in real life, it's, a, it's the size of a grain of rice. And it was the most common um, zooplankton in the Gulf of Maine. And food for, a huge number of species, including some that we recognize and that are important to us. The larval, uh, um, juvenile, larval and juvenile cod and other fish eat, eat calamus. It turns out that larval lobsters eat calamus. And it turns out that the right whale uh, and other baleen whales um, eat the calamus. And it could be that this change in decline in calamus is one reason why the right whales are have been less common in the Bay of Fundy over the last few years. Um, so it's, now something else is gonna fill into the niche of the calanus, but all of these organisms co-evolved over the last 10,000 years since the ice melted. So we're just mixing it up in a way that we have no idea what's gonna happen. And it's very hard to predict. I compare it to uh, the forest. I mean, you can go out and survey the trees, and you can go back a year later, and they're pretty much where they were the first time. Fish, not so much. Things change slowly in terrestrial ecosystems relative to the ocean. It is very dynamic when you think of tides, currents, storms, seasonal changes, etc. And it's, um, it's such a complex system that I always get nervous when scientists say, well, we've predicted that in 2050 there will be either more lobsters, less lobsters, whatever. Um, I take it with a grain of salt. Um, so what's at risk with a changing ecosystem for, sh for fisheries here in New England? Well, obviously, the livelihoods that are sustained by fishing, the character of our coastal communities, our coastal um, our fisheries-based ecosystem. So what are we doing about it? Let's we get past the depressing part and on to the, yes, there are things that can be done. Um, we're working on several projects uh, to ensure a thriving future for our fishermen and our coastal communities and for the Gulf of Maine. And we kind of put them into two categories, um, diversification and restoration. My colleague, Marissa McMahon, uh, is 
does most of the diversification work and I work on the restoration work. Um, so I'll be mentioning her research as I, uh, as I go forward. Um, again, another story in the uh, Mayor Daily News, which covers fisheries better than any other paper or news source in the country, in the state, as far as I'm concerned. But this is a story last week. Uh, the online version had the title, As Maine's Coastal Waters Warm, Lobstermen Look to New Fisheries for a Stable Future. And it, do, it doesn't say it in the headline, but in the story, one of those things they're looking to is aquaculture. And a few years ago, I go to the Maine Fisherman's Forum every year in March at the uh, Samoset, and the fishermen did not want to hear about this. Oh, sure. And they, it has definitely changed. Yeah. It has definitely changed. And they are... They're like, okay, what are we going to do? So from our perspective, the, f the future of fisheries in the Gulf of Maine needs to be about diversification. So diversifying what the fishermen have access to catch, um, diversifying the, their economic opportunities, aquaculture, uh, diversifying seafood products. Can we make something new out of stuff we already have? Um, and diversifying our seafood choices as consumers, and yes, this is where you all come in. Um, so the fishing starts to look more like it did 50 to 70 years ago, but some of those species that I showed you, the shrimp are gone, maybe we're going to have black sea bass, it won't be the same um, mix. So merging new species, uh, this, this is the black sea bass. Uh, so Marissa's uh, dad is a lobsterman in Georgetown, and in 2012, he said, what's this funny looking fish I caught in my trap? It was very, it was rare then. Just seven years later, it's pretty common. Um, we weren't used to seeing species like this. We used to see cod and haddock and that type of thing. So uh, historically, the northern range of the Black Sea bass was down here and in the mid-Atlantic. That's mid but it is definitely moving into the Gulf of Maine. In How big did black bass get? About like that. Big. I mean, I've only seen little ones. Yeah, yeah they're, a, they're a nice, firm, white flesh. I mean, in the, the, you can see them in the fish market in Portland. It's just like, we're not used to it. But it tastes really good. It's, mm -hmm. it's very good eating. So the problem that we faced was that although people were seeing it, we really didn't know what we were deal dealing with until we've been working with fishermen to um, get their reports on what they're seeing because this is important for figuring out whether we can have a fishery or not. And we have to be able to document, you know, where this is Casco Bay 2013, that's Georgetown 2014, there's Boston, Sheepskip Bay, and this is, the federal fisheries management is a very complicated process and you, they have a stock assessment and management process and you have to have data to, um, for them to say yes, you can have a fishery. Also, the poor fishermen down in the mid-Atlantic, they're now steaming hundreds of miles north to catch their fish. They have quotas, they don't want to give their quotas up, so it's, a, it's, a, it's not a simple um, process. But we have learned some lessons from southern New England. You've all heard that the lobster stock um, in southern New England has collapsed um, completely. And the fishermen there are adapting. Um, they are seeing increases in the Jonah crab, so it's a little different than the rock crab. It's bigger. Scup, another species we're not familiar with. Um, there's the black sea bass and squid. Um, which we're, we're somewhat familiar with. And last winter at the Maine Fishermen's Forum, there was a panel of fishermen from Rhode Island who were talking about how they've adapted. And this one fisherman made it, it said this quote that just was so instructive for us. These are some of my best years of fishing. I just never would have expected what it is I'm fishing for. Mm -hmm. So what that's who's the fish. This one? Yeah. It's a scup. S-C-U-P. And I should be able to tell you what the scientific name is, but I don't know. And that's okay. So. so it's an important message we need to be hearing and learning from these fishermen as the Gulf of Maine begins to look more and more like southern New England. Now, I think our lobsters are, are here for much longer 
who knows, but it's not next year or the year after, it's going to be longer than that. Okay, so aquaculture is another thing we're working on, and it is a growing industry in um, the Gulf of Maine, especially uh, people who just want to grow things, who are just, well, like uh, Mr. Hein in Belfast. Uh, it's so seaweed has come on strong. Um, this is a clam farm that I'm going to talk about in a minute. This is scallops, oysters, fairly, um, well, it was a new industry in the 1970s, is now growing rapidly here in Maine. This is my favorite new, anybody know what this one is? Seaweed? Well, it's lying in a bunch of seaweed, but that's an elver, yeah. the baby eel. Yeah. Okay. So you've read about the eel fishery. Yeah. $2,500 a pound for live eels. They ship them to China, they grow them out. So it's a very enterprising um, woman said, well, why don't we grow them out here? And she started right. doing it in her basement. She now has a company called American Unagi, and, um, and she's growing them out. Um, yeah. Where is that? Uh, she started at the Darling Center, Darling Marine Center, which is the University of Maine's lab on the Dammer Scott River, but now she is at the Agriculture Innovation Center in Franklin, where they, they basically have a big facility that's like, when you think you want to try and grow something here, you can do it here. So one of the first things we started working on, because uh, clams are so decimated in our, in our part of the coast, our um, landings are down, just really been hitting the harvesters hard, uh, was what can we do about this green crab? issue and because they are voracious predators of the, of the clams and um, they're also tough on salt marshes they burrow into them and, and apparently uh, chew on the roots and so they're causing erosion so what can we do for uh, can we do a form of clam aquaculture that will uh, protect them from the predators and uh, is this something that would help um, supplement the wild fishery and uh, with a, a grant from the um, National Fisheries Service, Manomet started the first uh, commercial scale soft shell clam fishery in, um, in Maine and uh, it involves putting a net over, putting the seed which you get from a hatchery into a bed and putting a net over it and um, protecting it from the green crabs. And you'll say, well, why are some sites not have nets? Well, we did this as a science experiment. So um, you have to test nets versus not nets. It's seeding versus not seeding and that kind of thing. Uh, the, we, on the basis of this, we, in our grant that we got, we put in farms in five other communities working with local harvesters and the project's still ongoing. And it's had mixed results, but we've, we've really learned a few things. Um, this picture shows that this is a net, you know, if you can see the, the net there, and this is where there isn't a net, and you can see that there are clams, clam holes, mm -hmm. and over here there aren't mm -hmm. any. Um, the, the, the clams, if they're not protected, are just consumed. Now, one of the things we learned was that this works well in a site where all you have is the green crabs, but we have another predator called the milky ribbon worm. You've heard of that one. And uh, this, this methodology does nothing against them. So we found that site selection is very important. The, the farms that we put in where there were the milky ribbon worm failed. So, um, so we're still working on that. And where it does work, it is something that the harvesters can use, you know, as a, to hedge their bets against the um, mortality. Um, and it, it's interesting because just like you were saying with your students in the tide pools, this year the green crabs are down. And the theory is that we had very cold spring. I'm sure you all heard that the lobster shed was very late. So it's, the shed is very much a function of water temperature in the spring. Um, in 2012, when it was very warm, we had the lobster shed too early and we had all kinds of problems. This year they shed too late. It remains to be seen whether the season just 
shifts later and they're still catching yeah. them in October, November, December. We'll see. Um, I, for their sake, I hope so. Um, but this made us also think about trying um, with a different species, which is the coho. Uh, they have a lot of potential for aquaculture here in Maine, but nobody has been culturing them. Oysters, mussels, um, clams, uh, yes, but not cohogs. And there is a wild harvest industry, but the, the cohogs uh, are not as abundant as the soft shell clams. So um, is there something that we can do to expand that? And um, we continued our partnership with the, the wild clam harvesters and said, well, let's try cohogs. They are uh, less vulnerable to predation because they have nice thick shells and they don't have bits hanging out that the green crabs can latch onto. Uh, similar harvesting techniques and, and licensing, you know, through the towns. And the, one of the benefits is that there is a higher market value for cohox than there is for clams and at a smaller size, so they don't have to wait as long um, to harvest them. And we're testing two techniques. One is the same, um, you know, predator net. And the other is to, to try growing them the way they grow oysters. And, you know, it's not a, the aquaculture is not um, completely separate from wild harvest. Uh, they're really a hybrid. For, well, for one thing, the, um, a lot of um, municipal shellfish committees buy seed from the hatchery and use it to seed their flats. But if you have a lot of adult cohogs in your here or in here in a bay or a cove, and they're spawning, you're going to supplement the wild harvest as well. So it's a, it's a, a two-part um, benefit. So here we are back to the green crab. Um, this is my um, colleague uh, Marissa who began thinking about, you know, we have this species that's here and it seems to be here to stay. They're thriving in warm waters. What if we try the, if you can't beat them, eat them strategy? <laughs> and she uh, learned that there, there's a very similar species in, this is one of her neighbors who's an art historian who goes to Venice, and he said, you know, when I go there, I, my favorite dish is this thing that looks just like those green crabs you're always complaining about. And so he found a fisherman who came over here, she went over there, and she learned how they do it. And it was, it was a really fascinating process. They, there they get $55 a pound for the soft shell green crabs. So it's a little bit, you know, the crab and the, the, the blue crab. If you've ever had it, you, when they're hard shell, you know, you're whacking them with the, the hammer. But when they're soft shell, they're so good. But the, that crab has the, the, it's easier to deal with because it really signals very clearly when it's about to molt. The um, green crab is much um, trickier to figure it out. And so this learning from the uh, Italians, you have to look at different parts of the shell to tell that it is two to three week, weeks away from molting. So you put it in a separate, um, is there a picture of one? No, but a floating box, like the ones they put the lobsters in. And, uh, but there's only about 10% of the ones you catch that are about, that are in the pre-molt stage. So you get a lot of green crabs for not very many of them. Um, Do we know how to induce molting? No. No. People are trying to figure that out. There's got to be some trigger to it. It only happens, you know, over about a two-month period in the summer. Is it temperature? Is it light? Is it chemical? What is it? They have not, but if they figured that one out, of course, you'd have to put them in a tank, and putting things in tanks is expensive, but uh, it could be done. Um, I mean, the green crabs, at least my experience with them, is when they're molding, they don't take bait, so you have to go out and net each one. At least that's how we did it when I was a kid, you know. I don't mean the green crab, the blue crab. Oh, the blue crab. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like the lobsters. The lobsters molt and then they hide. Right. Until their shells firm up right. and then they're really hungry. So the idea, though, is they catch them here 
before they're bolting in. Yes. In yeah. Yeah. So now we um, are working on a green crab fishery, and there's a couple of local fishermen who started using this, applying what they had learned uh, last year, and they were selling to local residents for three dollars each, twenty-five dollars, twenty-five to thirty dollars a pound. And the restaurants, this is in Brunswick, were putting them on the menu, and people couldn't get enough of them. <laughs> so. Uh, but this uh, young man became the uh, first person in the U.S. to sell soft-shell green crabs um, uh, commercially. So now that we know how to recognize the pre-molts um, and train others, we can harvest them seasonally and store them in cages until they molt, and it has a high market value. So that's part of the key. And they make all kinds of delicious things out of them. Um, I have tried several, many of these, if not all of them, and they are delicious. And they are also working on using the ones that aren't molting. They're, the food lab up at the University of Maine has um, figured out how to make them into a mint. They've got some machine up there. And, and you can, you can put, use that uh, as, a, as a filling for something and they make a stock, which the chefs, the chef who um, uh, Marissa works with in Brunswick, she said, if you watch the Food Network for 30 seconds, they talk about umami, which is the, something that gives something a lot of flavor. She said, this is perfect for giving, for providing some umami. I didn't really know what she was talking about, but she was excited about it, so that was all we needed to know. So anyway, that's, so look for green crabs in a restaurant near you soon. Okay, so now I want to shift to talk more about my work, which uh, relates to management, which is you wouldn't necessarily think of as a restoration tool, but I do. And then uh, habitat restoration work we're doing with river herring and hillwives. Okay, so I told you about how cod had collapsed in the Gulf of Maine, but lobster is a completely different story. And a lot of it is due to the form of management that we have in the lobster fishery. It's called co-management. It is shared responsibility for management of the fishery between the fishermen and the main department of marine resources. So why this is 1950? You can see that landings were roughly 20 million pounds for, and it goes back before that, uh, and then all of a sudden just shot up. Um, why, why is this? Uh, there are a bunch of reasons. We're, it's hard to tell exactly which ones are most important at any given time. Climate change probably has been good for lobsters in the Gulf of Maine. They like the warmer temperatures up to a point. The southern New England is a cautionary tale. Uh, is there an equal number of fishermen? Yeah, that's what so I was So that's wondering. a good question. Um, yes, the number of fishermen in, when it's, things started to take off here, more fishermen gave up their ground fish licenses because there's no ground fish to catch, so there were a lot more fishermen. And they, shifted and they shifted from wooden traps to wire traps, mm -hmm. so they could actually fish a lot more territory. They didn't fish wooden traps on muddy bottom because the traps would rot faster. Huh. So was that part of it that uh, I was saying before um, we got started, the federal government was like, you are overfishing, you are overfishing, we're going to shut it down. And um, enterprising scientists at the University of Maine went out there and did um, uh, sampling, um, in, uh, fisheries independent sampling is what they call it, because landings are not a really good measure of what's out there. It's just a measure of what the fishermen are catching. But they found out that actually their, the lobsters were becoming super abundant. I mean, there are ecologically more lobsters than have been there uh, before. I wonder if G, uh, GPS affects it too. You can now go to a location and that will come so, in. So you're more efficient at it, you mean? Yes. Well, I don't know. The fishermen are pretty darn smart, I think, even without, well, of course, the older fishermen will say the younger fishermen can't fish without the technology. Yeah, right. You know, you've heard that. Uh, 
but they're, um, they know what they're doing. Now, one thing, we did talk about how the cod decline, the cod are predators. So this is also what the ecologists would call predation release. Yeah. So there's some of that. Sure. And it's one reason why a lot of lobstermen don't want to see the cod come back. Yeah. Others say, sure. you know sure. what, if you let yeah. me catch yeah. those cod, yeah. I'll take my chances. Yeah. You know, that's, the, that's sort of the attitudes are changing. Part of the ecology. And yes. But one thing that's, that's uh, sort of struck me over the last years, how does this relate that the more you, the more traps that are out there, the more bait is going in there. It's just one giant lobster hat, uh, nursery out there. So, so you're, you're creating a bigger fishery. Uh, there is that argument and people have tried to test uh, the stomach contents of lobsters and what percentage of their, their bait, of their stomach contents is herring. And uh, there's one study that says it's a lot and another one that says it's not. <laughs> So, and you know, the, the herring come out of the Gulf of Maine and go back into it. Sure. Now, we also know that the traps are not so much traps, you know, with the cone-shaped nets, you used to think the lobsters would climb in and couldn't get out. We know from time-lapse photography, they They've climb up just go. fine. So the ones you catch just happen to be in there. So they're more buffets than they are traps. <laughs> but they're also monitoring devices. So there's a state trap limit of 800 traps. These fishermen use them, they use them to hold territory, you know, you see the buoys. Um, but they are also moving them, well in this part of the coast, down east where you have these horrendous tides, they don't move them because it's, they have to put so much weight in them just to get them to stay Just to keep them there. Yeah. But here they, they, they put them in and they, they follow them as they come in and they follow them as they go out. Um, so the, the, well, I'm going to get down my, I want to, Go back to where I was going to um, tell you the rest of the story and, and it'll answer some of these other questions. So all of this uh, story about the lobster fishermen and their ability to manage their fishery, the conservation ethic that it's known as, it really started in the 1920s when the fishery was collapsed. They overfished it and it collapsed. Now, that was something that would have been predicted by this man, Garrett Hardin, who is well known for having written a very famous paper on the tragedy of the commons. Of course, we have what we have out here is the commons. And what he said was, if you have a commons, it'll always be over-harvested because it won't be in any one fisherman's interest to leave fish if somebody else is going to catch it. And so you either need to privatize the, the resource or you need government regulation. And that was the conventional wisdom until Eleanor Ostrom came along and she studied the commons. Uh, the lobster fishery was one of her, um, her uh, examples that she, she cited very often, but she cited the commons of all kinds. She studied uh, water resources under Southern California. She, she studied uh, sheep in the high meadows in the Alps. And she said, yes, often there is a tragedy of the commons, but not always. There are a lot of examples, and she and her graduate students documented them, where resource users figure out how to regulate their use. And she identified the conditions under which that happened. And um, the lobster fishery is an example of that. So they collapsed the fishery in the 1920s. There are not a lot of other options for economic activity if you live on Vinyl Haven in the 1920s or Machias, uh, they have small wooden boats, they're underpowered, they can't chase the lobsters offshore the way they do now, they, they can't switch to another fishery, and they, it's also the depression, they're like, okay, we, we have to figure this out. And they came up with a series of what we call conservation measures to protect the resource. So the most famous one is what they call the double gauge. You, they don't catch the small ones. You want them to get big enough to be of reproductive size. You don't want to catch the big ones. The big females produce exponentially more eggs. So you don't want to catch those. You don't want to harvest the, um, the buried females. Um, you know what I mean by that? The lobsters are unusual and they extrude their eggs and it looks like berries under their tail. Well, that's obviously a breeding female. So they came up with this idea of notching the tails, the tail, one of the tail flippers with a V-notch. Now, 
The government could never enforce a rule that says you must do this. The fishermen came up with this on themselves. Now, they, did, they would go to Augusta and say, we want to make this a law. And they would just test different things. I don't know which things they tested that didn't work, but the escape vent on the, well, let's let the little ones out. Um, the, they wanted to prevent ghost fishing if the, tra if the trap is lost. There is a panel that is held on with uh, hog rings that rust. Let them, so a series of things like that that they came up with. And they fished in informal territories which they banded together to protect from marauding fishermen from other harbors. So it prevented too many fishermen fishing in one place. And in 1995, this was all informal. This was, except for they go up to Augusta and get their laws, but they, they did all this, and not the Department of Marine Resources. Uh, but when things started to get where there were too many traps, they couldn't figure out how to solve the problem because too many traps here is a lot different than too many traps here. And our, uh, the wonderful Commissioner of Marine Resources at the time, Robin Alden, proposed this management structure with a series of zones where the fishermen could decide overall limit of 800 traps. But within that, you could, you could have less traps if you thought that, that you could make as much money with less traps if you could get your, your people to agree. And this was adopted in 1995. It's a system called co-management, where the fishermen get the say in making some of the rules, not all of them. And um, the, uh, the state is taken on responsibility for enforcement. So we have less of the lobster wars, because now the guys, if they think that somebody is, is cheating, they call Marine Patrol. And um, so it's really worked a lot better. But one of the reasons that this works is that it's also ecologically relevant. So what are the drivers of the lobster population? The, you know, the bottleneck in any population is the young getting to be older. And so they're lar the larvae are in the water column once they hatch from under the female's tail. They're in the water column for several weeks, depending on the water temperature. And some of the larvae get entrained in this, in this cross along the coast current. But many are retained in the bays because there's an eddy around a rock or behind an island. And they have so sort of two sources of larvae, which provides some, some diversity, some stability. But it also means that what the fishermen in Penobscot Bay do to protect their resources is going to have an impact in Penobscot Bay. And the same in each of the other zones. So it's ecologically relevant conservation measures, if that makes sense to you. So, uh, so some places, they uh, the big thing that they work on now is they close the fishery. Not anybody can get in there. And the only way you can get a license is if a fisherman retires. So in some places, the, the, the entry-exit ratio is one new fisherman, five have to retire because they know they have too many people. In uh, Swans Island, which is one of my favorite places, they have their own little zone. They only fish 400 traps. They say, we don't need all those traps. So uh, some places you can't fish on Sundays. Some places they are like, you can only have two, two traps on a trawl. Other places you can have 20 traps on a trawl. So they use their own um, techniques and they share their information, which fishermen are loath to do, because they get a say in the rulemaking. And uh, to me, this is a very powerful form of management. When you have 4,500 boats out there, they are data collectors. These fishermen are scientists of a kind. And um, you really can't, when you look at the landings, argue with the results. I mean, some of it is luck, but a lot of it is that is they're doing. So then let's go um, back to the cod. Can I ask a question? Sure. In Canada, um, they don't fish lobster in the summer. And why, why that difference? So their argument is soft shell lobsters are less valuable. I mean, you go to the store. Right. Do you want, right. do you want a soft shell or do you want a hard shell? Like, well, let's just catch them in the winter when they're hard and the, and the value is greater. 
and they have a, um, a top-down form of government. Even the provinces don't have a lot of say. They have some say. So it's really driven by you know, what the scientists say and the, and the fishermen um, go along with it. Uh, but they also benefit from our shutter season because many of our lobsters go there. They have a processing industry. We are now just developing a processing industry so that we don't have to send so many lobsters up there. Although now because of the Chinese tariffs, we have to send our lobsters there. Because China put a tariff on our lobsters, but not Canada's. Um, that means your question. It's really interesting. I mean, there's a there's a political boundary down through the middle of a body of water that could care less, and you know the different strategies are are very interesting. Is there a reason to think one strategy is better than the other? The summer, summer, uh, and summer. I think the legacy of the summer harvest here is something that it would be very hard for uh, the fishermen to not do. Mm -hmm. Plus, you do, the, I mean, there are many fishermen who fish offshore in the winter, and, you know, you're out there, a, a big lobster boat today is, you know, 50 feet. That's a big lobster boat. Out there, that's, in the winter, is not a big boat. Yeah. So, um, I'm not sure that they, I think that would be culturally, they've been doing this for 100 years. And it's interesting, you can talk to fishermen today, and they can tell you chapter and verse what happened over the last 100 years. It's, and the handing down of the information is really fascinating. Uh, okay, so the same phenomenon actually happens in the cod fishery, where there are local drivers of the population. So these are little uh, cartoons that are meant to indicate uh, spawning grounds. So the cod don't just all get together in one big ball in, in the spring in the middle of the Gulf of Maine and spawn. They spawn serially up and down the coast, and there are hundreds, probably thousands, of these spawning grounds, and these are actually just way too big, but if I made them too small, you wouldn't be able to see them. Unfortunately, the reason the cod stock has collapsed is that many of these were, were eliminated. They were wiped out. So we began to figure it out in the 80s and 90s. These were already gone. So there are what they call rolling closures in the spring. That sort of protects what we have left of the, of the um, cod fishery. Uh, and it's all managed by the federal government now because the, um, the near shore stocks are gone. And the, and the federal government sees this as the size of the stock rather than as a series of substocks. And so they manage the quotas based on this, the size of the whole. And they, and they spawn in these little areas, and then a lot of them go off into the Gulf of Maine for the rest of the year. Some of them are regional. There's a lot of different subpopulations with different strategies. But when you put a quota on to protect the fishery, uh, but don't do anything to protect the spawning grounds, then you don't have a, a successful management. Um, so the Manomet is a founding partner of something called the Down East Fisheries Partnership, which is 10 nonprofit organizations working in eastern Maine to restore fisheries. And this is one of the things this group is working on. Uh, tackling federal management is, is hard. Um, my, one of my favorite quotes is from a Danish scientist who said, fisheries management isn't rocket science. It's much harder. <laughs> um, but because we have this track record of doing this in the, in the lobster fishery, and now we're doing it in the scallop fishery in this region. We think that there's some hope that we could start this process in state waters and then eventually um, in federal waters. What's the correlation between, again, the Maritimes uh, cod fisheries and New England? Well... Because they're still shut down, aren't yes. they? Yes. And... So we think of this as a big cod stock not, not, the biggest cod stock in the world is the Barents Sea, which is north of Norway and Russia. Mm -hmm. um, the Norwegian Sea, the North Sea, and then, well, out here, the Grand Banks and off of Newfoundland. Huge, huge stock. And the industrial fishing fleet of the, um, that, that geared up after World War II with all the new technology that became available, managed to crash that. I personally think it is the largest uh, harvest of biomass by humans probably in human history. 
you know, it's kind of thing. But I could imagine. Yeah. You, I mean, it's hard to prove. Yeah. Um, so I asked people, you know, what do you think? And somebody's like, well, what about the buffalo? And I'm like, buffalo were two dimensional. Yeah. <laughs> the cog, or somebody else, uh, my boss actually said, I don't know, what about the carrier pigeon? And I'm like, mm, mm -hmm. I don't know. They weren't as good to eat, so I don't know. So um, that, and now there seems to be signs that the Newfoundland stock is coming back. It's creeping back. Creeping back. Yeah. So we'll see, but it has been since 1995. Yeah. Yeah. Something so it's been, yeah. Uh, I think the Barents Sea is doing well because that is one heck of a place to fish. That controls it. I think that's part <laughs> of it. Uh, okay, so I didn't show you that's the larger where the fish go when they're not um, spawning. And so one of our one of our theories is that. We should go back to hook and line fishing on the coastal shelf because spawning fish, we were talking about that, don't feed. And um, this is, so lobsters and cod are obviously very different. Lobsters ag um, do not aggregate to spawn. Cod make the mistake of aggregating to spawn. Makes them much easier to catch. So if you used a, a technology that didn't target spawning fish, you know, line caught cod, line caught fish are all the rage now in trendy restaurants. You can get a much better price for this fish, so it's not a terrible fishery for somebody who the rest of the time is lobstering or scalloping or something like that. Okay, so now let's talk about um, restoration, habitat restoration, and my favorite topic is uh, river herring or alewife. So I was hoping this was an alewife, but it's not. It's a mint. Was but, that is that white? Is that label correct? Well, I took it at its word because it's the Penobscot Marine Museum. They wouldn't just label <laughs> it. It, it looks like it. It, it doesn't be. look like it in the no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Well, you'll take it up with that. Huh. Um, so, river herring, as a, I'm worried about, I'm going to try and go through this fast because we're almost done. The, um, are a, an anadromous fish, which means they live in the ocean and they spawn in fresh water. Like um, the most famous example is salmon. And the Atlantic salmon, of course, endangered. Um, but we have them here in the Gulf of Maine. We have 11 um, species of sea brown fish. And, um, and this is one of our interests with the Downey's Fisheries Partnership is they are all still extant in eastern Maine's rivers. They're just at low abundance. Um, and we think we can bring them back. But the, uh, the, the alewife um, is a hugely important, or was a hugely important forage fish, along with Atlantic herring, which is a true, uh, similar size, similar forage, but is just a marine species. So the cod and the haddock had these two sources that they could count on until we industrialized our rivers, log drives, um, dams for uh, power and uh, pollution. Uh, and then the over-harvesting of the LY. So basically, we're probably at between 5 and 10% of historic levels of these fish. But they are a keystone species in the ecosystem. And we think of them as a river fish, but they're mostly, they spend most of their lives in, um, in the ocean. So 20 years ago, the Edwards Dam in Augusta, momentous, it was the first dam to be removed um, against the wishes of the dam owner, and it unleashed a wave of uh, uh, dam removals across the country. Apparently something like 2,000 dams have, have, have been removed and, and um, you know, many here in, uh, in Maine, Penobscot River Restoration Project. Um, they're working on the Mousum and the Kenny Bunks, uh, Cabas County and Gardner, the Sebastopol, China Lake, uh, the Union River in Ellsworth is a big one that we're working on, the Narragwagas, the East Manchise, the Orange River. Um, and the waiting, and the next big one is the St. Croix. Now, this dam had been there for 160 years. Did anybody know what was going to happen? No. But these fish, I like to say they're not smart, but they're persistent. Mm -hmm. They have come back in droves, and that's what's really inspired a lot of um, restoration efforts. And some of the, um, the big ones get the press, but some of the small ones, this is the bag of juice, and this was driven by a fisherman in the town of Penobscot who was mad that the um, alewives had been um, um, treated so badly in the bag of deuce. And he's, he's led this uh, amazing restoration effort and uh, 
took this um, video that I just love, um, the last frame, and heard the gurgling water sound effects. And so he, he, they got a dam removed, um, they put in a uh, nature-like fishway, and the fish are like, great, we're back, we're ready, we're, we're going to do it. But, but, but now the salmon returned because that's where they were, that's where they hatched. Yes. Do they do the same thing? River herring less picky. River herring, so um, what's interesting about the salmon is they're famous for going back to their natal rivers. Um, they do have a, what they call a stray rate. So some percentage of the, um, you can turn the lights off when you want me to stop talking, the, uh, of the salmon go back to a different river because um, maybe your river is going to get wiped out. Maybe maybe we need to mix up the genes a little bit. Yeah, they're, they're genetic but, aberrant. Right, right. But alewives have a much bigger stray rate. It's something like forty percent of them. But in order to get them to come back, did they have to start some of them yes. up the river? Yes. So before they took the dam out and put in the fishway, they uh, for a number of years in a row, would, the fish would come to the bottom of the. And they would put them in buckets and carry them up and put them over. So, it, yeah, it is it amazing. Um, Who was the guy that wow. did um, His name's Bailey Bowden. He's wonderful. If you look up on the Maine Coast Heritage Trust website, there's a video of him. And they, they so he partnered with them, and, uh, and the Maine Coast Heritage Trust is a partner in the Denny's Fisheries Partnership uh, because they're good at, at uh, getting federal grants and whatnot. And, um, uh, it's, he's, uh, I wish I had brought the video of him. He's, sitting, he's one of my favorites. So this is what happened in the Penobscot. I mean, that was a huge, I don't know, $60 million effort, two dams, uh, and it went from, no, I think, nine, 90 fish in 2012 to, and it's just going up and up. Because once they took out the main stem dams, they're taking out dams on the, on the trips. So it's, um, uh, it's amazing. And one of the things I love about this is that the upstream migration is, you know, what I don't know if you've vi and you visited a alewife run in the spring. It was really worth it. It is just this miracle of nature, and and it shows that we can put things back together. It's very inspiring for people. This is Dammer Scott.